All right, so let's look at, um, so we're looking at figure four on lecture 16. Hold on, oh, I got a new clippy here. Let's see how that works. Even worse than before. Is that too, is, is that too low? That's fine, yeah. It'll pick that up? Okay. All right, so the question was about using our derivatives property to get the derivative of, of this function. Oh, I think we got good board today. I think we got good board. Okay, and that was 1, 1, and 1. 1, 1, x of t. Right? Now, so if the goal is to get that Fourier transform, we know the barring all other tricks, we can do the following, which is to say that x of omega is going to equal the integral from 0 to 1 of, what is x of t on the interval from 0 to 1? t. t. It's the line t, e to the minus j omega t dt. Okay? You do that integral, get the right answer. No ifs, ands, or buts. Would you expect my answer to be purely real, purely complex, or neither? Neither. Neither. Why? It's neither an even nor an odd function. Neither an even nor an odd function. Okay, good. Nor could it be made an even or an odd function by moving it. Okay, this integral is actually not that hard to do. Because basically you just got, let's see, t e to the a t. So let's see, that would be uh, 1, <coughs> 1 over a e to the a t, and 0. No, that's all I do, right? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, so that integral would come out to be... Um, no, 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 I have to do the next one, right? 0, 1 over a squared e to the a t. So my total integral is going to be t over a e to the a t minus, I'm just integrating by parts in case you're wondering what I'm doing, 1 over a squared e to the a t, which is e to the a t times t over a minus 1 over a squared. And in our case, a is equal to minus j omega. So I took this. I'm integrating it by parts just because I'm too lazy to look it up in the, um, like a table of integrals. I'm figuring out that my a is equal to negative j omega. So I'm going to do that substitution and sub in my limits of integration. I just want to do this problem two ways to verify that I get the same answer both ways. So let's see. If I do that, I'm going to get e to the minus j omega t times uh, t over negative j omega minus 1 over negative j omega squared on the interval from t equals 0 to t equals 1. Am I good? So let's sub in. If I sub in t equals 1, I get e to the minus j omega times 1 over negative j omega uh, minus 1 over minus j omega squared. That's my first term. And now I'm going to substitute in 0. Is that right? And e to the 0 is, so I sub in 0. So e to the 0 is 1. That's nice. OK. 0 subbed in for this is 0. So I'm just left with minus. 1 over minus j omega squared. So I've got a little polishing to do here, but not a ton. Um, 1 over minus j omega squared cancel. Uh, no, they don't cancel. Um, they don't cancel because of that term. Uh, yeah. uh, but there is, a little, there is a little polishing we can do there to turn it into a cosine of some sort, I think. OK, this term becomes. <coughs> e to the negative j omega, minus e to the negative j omega over j omega. And then I've got, um, let me try this. What if we say 1 over minus j omega squared times, ugh, let me do this trick. I'm trying to see how much time I want to invest in trying to tidy this up a little bit. 
Maybe I'll do one more step, and then we'll try the, the, inter, the derivatives yeah, approach. No, no, no. Oh, you figured it out? No, I think it's, it's worth, I mean, I want everyone to see it, because we didn't spend a ton of time on this, and this is a useful property. Um, let me just leave it like this for now. Let's, see, let's, let's do the other approach first and see how much we actually need to tidy this up to look like the other one. Okay, so question. Can we get this? So whatever. The point is you do a bunch of calculus. It gets ugly. Can we get the same answer by doing derivatives and integrals on this guy? Answer, yes. Okay, so take x of t, take its derivative. What do we get? You get a square from 0 to 1. Okay, and then what happens? Like that? Right, I want to make sure everybody sees that this is not the derivative, right? This is not dx dt. No. This is tricky. Look, if this was dx dt, what would x be? Okay, so in other words, integrate this. If this is in fact dx dt, if you integrate it, you should get back your, your x, right? So let's integrate this. So we'll start at negative infinity, we have 0. So we're integrating, we're integrating 0, nothing changes, right? When you integrate 0, nothing changes. Now I get to here, I'm integrating a constant. So when you integrate a constant, you get a straight line, so that's good. And now I'm back to integrating 0. And when you integrate 0, what happens? You just don't have anything. There's no change, right? I mean, when you integrate 0, that means don't change anything. Okay, so is that what I need? No. So this is, in fact, not the derivative of x of t, because this is the derivative of this function. But that's not the function I want. I want that function. So how can I amend this so that it will, in fact, be the derivative of x of t? I'm going to add a big old impulse here. An impulse with area one. negative 1. OK? Because what that's going to do is right when you get to, I mean, everything else will be the same. You'll get, you'll get your, your slope. But then when you integrate this negative 1, when you integrate this impulse, you'll get an instantaneous offset of negative 1. I mean, look at this. This is like a line, right? A line with a slope of, an, it, like an infinity negative slope, but its area is negative 1. It takes you one unit down. So this is, in fact, my derivative. Now, so this is dx dt. Can I take the, can I take the uh, Fourier transform of that by inspection? Absolutely. Right? I've got two pieces of this. So remember, 0 is where? Here? That's 0. And this is 1. t equals 1. So I've got two pieces here. I've got a square pulse. Is that right? I've got a square pulse, and I've got a impulse. impulse. So let's start with the square pulse. What's the Fourier transform of the square pulse? Uh, 1 plus negative 1 to the Well, forget about the impulse for a second. Let's just do the square. The square is going to be a sinc function, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so what is the Fourier transform just of that sinc function? Right, so remember, the first thing we need to know is what's our little a, right? What's the half width of this thing? It's half a. It's, it's, it's a half, right? Because you can imagine that the center point of this thing is a half, so that this is the, that's your value of a. So it's sine of a omega over a, oops, a omega times times the area. What is the area? One. Area is 1, so that's good. Now I have to give it a shift to the right of half a unit. How do I take, because this is the Fourier transform of a square pulse that's centered at 0. Now I've got to shift it to the right by half, right, so it's going to be e to the minus 0.5 omega. So now I've shifted my square pulse to the right by half. J, thank you. Okay. So that's good. And now I need to deal with the impulse. What's going to be the Fourier transform of my impulse? 
minus 1. E to the negative j omega. Right. If it was minus 1, that would be an impulse located at t equals 0. Right? But it's shifted to the right by one unit. So it's not just minus 1. It's minus 1 times e to the minus j omega. That shifts it over to t equals 1. So, nope, to 1. It's right here. Half is here. I need to shift this impulse to t equals 1. Because that's where this is. Right. So now, all of this is an expression for the integral. Sorry, this is the expression of the derivative of x. So now if I want to get x, just divide by j omega. So let's see. j omega. j omega. And that's the Fourier transform of x of t. It's ugly, but I'm guessing if you clean it up a little bit, you could probably get something that looks like what you have over there. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that that is the case. Yeah, that's right. Because look, you've got an e to the j omega over j omega. And we definitely have that. We had the e to the j omega over j omega. And then over here, let's see, you've got sine of half omega. Sine of half omega is what? That's uh, e to the half, e to the half j omega minus e to the minus half j omega over, uh, over 2j. That's my sine. e to the minus j 0.5 omega all over j omega 0.5 omega. So let's see, that 2 cancels with this half. So now I've got j omega times j omega. So that's j omega squared over this times this is 1 minus e to the minus j omega. Oh, look at that. Look at that. J omega, 1 over j omega squared times 1 minus e to the mi minus j omega. So it's all there. So, you know, we had to be careful with this stuff. It's cool that it works. It's important to understand it, like how these pieces are put together and how they relate to each other. But again, I, I, I want to emphasize that your value of an engineer is not your ability to be able to do this stuff, because you'll always use a computer to take a Fourier transform, right? But there is value to understanding the relationships between these things and, and like, at least on paper, how it's going to change things. Yes? Um, for the impulse up, up in the top right corner, you have a minus e to the minus j omega. Yeah. That's because it was shifted right. Correct. If it was shifted left, it would be a positive e to the negative j omega. No. It's a good question. Let's, let's, let's iron that out. The, okay, there's two, there's two minuses in there. Still not great erasing, but better. Mm. Okay. Well, I can live with that. So there's two things. You've got an impulse, right? So here's your impulse at with area one located at t equals zero. If you take the Fourier transform of that, right? If you take the Fourier transform of that, right? So Fourier transform of x of t, what do you get? One. It's just a constant. Okay. What if I take my impulse and instead of having it have an area of positive one, I give it an area of negative one? What's its Fourier transform? Negative. The constant negative one. What if I take that impulse and shift it to the right by one unit? What if I take okay? What if I take this and shift it to the right by one unit? If I shift it to the right by one unit, I'm going to have my, my original 1 times e to the minus j omega. And what about if I take this term and shift it to the right by 1? It'll be negative 1 shifted to the right by 1 unit. What if I shift it to the left by 1 unit? 1 e to the positive j omega. And if I take this guy and shift it to the right, to the left by one unit, minus. it'll be minus one 
e to the positive j omega. So the minus 1 tells me that <coughs> the area of the impulse is negative 1. And then the, what's going on in the exponent tells me the shift. Yes, sir. If the original one was centered at zero, then it wouldn't. If it's centered at zero, yeah. Then yeah, if we slide that to the left. So if you, so you're saying, what if it looked like this? So this is minus a half, and this is a half. <coughs> okay, you tell me. It's a good question. If you follow this approach. Your derivative would still look like that. The only difference now is that this would be 0. This would be shifted to a half. That's it. Yeah, it's a little easier. I mean, it is really just not that much different. Because then you'd still have to shift. Once you got the answer for this, you'd still have to multiply it by e to the minus j omega to shift it back to the right by half a unit to get what you wanted in the first place. But yeah, this is a little easier. There's only one right answer. What do you think? OK. Um, so Monday, we talked about probably, you know, I said there's really only a handful of really critically important things you're going to learn in this class. And Monday, believe it or not, was one of them. OK? So, uh, Monday we had the following conversation. We did a derivation. Now, this was specific to the low-pass filter, right? Remember, we did, here's what we did Monday. We took, we started, I showed you a circuit, right? The low-pass filter RC circuit. From there, we derived its differential equation. And once we had the differential equation, we took its Fourier transform. And once we got the Fourier transform, we were able to write the Fourier transform in the following format. We were able to say that V out as a function of omega, so V out in the frequency space, equaled H of omega times V in of omega. So in other words, what we said was, take your input signal, take its Fourier transform, Take that and multiply it against something that we're going to call the transfer function for our circuit. And that will tell you the output signal that you should, the Fourier transfer of the output. So in other words, for the low pass filter, we calculated that our transfer function was 1 over j omega rc plus 1. That's what we got when we manipulated the low pass filter. Okay? And if you were to plot the magnitude of that, right, if you were to plot the magnitude of h of omega, you would find that it looks like that. The low frequencies, the magnitude is 1, and the high frequencies, the magnitude is 0, or very small. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take our input signal, our arbitrary input signal, <clears throat> and take its Fourier transform. So our arbitrary input signal has some energy. And essentially what the formula is telling us, so this is our V in as a function of omega. And essentially what this is telling us is, is that if you want to figure out the Fourier transform of your output, what you got to do is you look at each frequency and you say, okay, this frequency, I'm multiplying this number by 1. In fact, it looks like all the frequencies up until 
my cutoff, right, all of this energy is going to be multiplied by 1. So that's going to come through more or less the same. But then at higher frequencies, my filter is going to remove these values, right? So in other words, this number, whatever that, whatever that input volt, uh, value is at that frequency, I'm going to be multiplying it by 0, okay? So really what I'm looking at here is something that, that's going to look like that. So this is the output value for omega, the output voltage with respect to frequency. So, <clears throat> and that's good. If you can take the inverse Fourier transform of that, you can see my signal versus time, right? But we learned early this semester that, you know, if you take a signal and look at it versus time or versus frequency, it's the same information, right? It's the same, it's the same signal. It's just that you can represent it versus time, or if you take its Fourier transform, you can represent it versus frequency. Well, look, here you go. I'm telling you right here, this is your output signal, okay? I'm just expressing it versus frequency, but it's, it's unique. Like, that's your output signal. So it turns out that, so we, we and we got to this, all this analysis we did was, was sort of depending on, we started with a low-pass filter. But really, you can do this for any filter, right? This equation, this is the money right here. This is the stuff. This equation always holds true. This is at the core of signal processing, all right? For a linear time invariant system, take the Fourier transform of your input, multiply it by the transfer function, you get the Fourier transform of the output. That is one of your key equations for the semester. The only thing that's going to differ if you change filters is the value of h of omega, right? The properties of, of, the, of the, the circuit. All right, so, so let's do, let's just for practice, let's do another... Um, Let's do a high-pass filter just to kind of see how this works, all right? And in doing the, the high-pass filter equation, we're actually going to um, employ a shortcut that's going to skip us. We don't even need to bother getting the differential equation, right? Because that's nice, too. I mean, this was, everything we did was true. It's just that we're really not going to do all those steps every time we analyze a circuit, right? So what if I gave you this circuit? So I think most of you have probably seen this before. It's the, you know, the opposite of a low pass. Right? You just swap the resistor and capacitor. So we're pretty sure we can get a high pass. So let's solve for the transfer function. Right? Let's solve for the transfer function h of omega. Without, getting, without even having to stop at the differential equation stage. You with me? So, you've probably seen this in circuits too before. Wait, shouldn't that be an inductor? Nope. No? Nope. It's just the orders reverse? Yep. You could do it with an inductor. Right. I'm just, I don't want to use an inductor. If you did an inductor, it would have to be resistor inductor. Okay. But if I have a capacitor resistor, it'll also be a high pass filter. Thanks. All right. So, anybody remember the equation for capacitor? I'm sure some of you might. I equals C dVdt, good. Okay, and if we apply the Fourier transform to that equation, what do you get? I of omega equals C. Careful. V over. Right, it's the derivative of V. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Fourier transform of my voltage, and then if I want to take its derivative, I, no, I multiply. Multiply by j omega. That's how you get a derivative. Okay. And I'm used to seeing circuit equations as V equals IR. Right? And it's really not in the V equals IR form yet. So why don't I rewrite this as V of omega equals uh, I of omega times, times what? Z, and what is that Z? 
No, but like, what, what do I, what's the actual equation now? 1 over j omega c. Okay, so that's your, that's your capacitor impedance. So basically what this means is that when I go to analyze this circuit, I can use regular old circuit analysis and just think of that capacitor <laughs> as a resistor whose value is 1 over j omega c. And I don't even need to do the differential equation. So watch this. Is that a voltage divider? You bet. You know, the board really isn't that much better today. You should use something. Ugh. OK. All right, so. Does anybody remember how, uh, how <laughs> voltage divider works? Yeah, it's this impedance over the sum of the two. Okay, so V out, V out of omega is going to equal V in of omega times R over R plus my impedance for the capacitor, not C, but the capacitor impedance, 1 over J omega C. Right? That's what we just decided. The capacitor impedance will always be 1 over J omega C. All right. That's looking pretty good. We can tidy up. So, so this is, is, remember, we said it's the same, same as before. Output equals input times transfer function. So all of this is my transfer function. So it's a fraction with a fraction in it. That's kind of... It's kind of bush league. Can we tidy that up a little bit? Right. If I multiply numerator and denominator by j omega c, so that's like the standard trick for cleaning that up. So the standard trick is if I do, I can always take a fraction and multiply it by, I can always multiply it by 1, right? That never changes my fraction. Right. You can always multiply by 1. So if I do that, what happens to my numerator? j omega rc. And what happens to my denominator? j omega rc plus 1. j omega rc plus 1. And that's your transfer function for a high-pass filter. Is it a high-pass filter? I don't know. What happens at really low frequencies? At really low frequencies, look what happens. So in the denominator at really low frequencies, which term dominates? The 1. So you're left with j omega rc over 1. And if omega is really, really small, then j omega rc is? Zero. Really, really small, 0. OK, so low frequencies, h is small. At really high frequencies, what term dominates in the denominator? At high frequencies, the j omega rc is going to be a lot bigger than the 1. So you can ignore the 1, and you're left with j omega rc over j omega rc, which is 1. So at low frequencies, you're getting 0. At high frequencies, you're getting 1. So you got yourself a high-pass filter. OK? Now, given this analysis, you can very quickly, very adeptly, get the transfer function for just about any filter I give you, okay? So, so for example, I could give you I can give you that transfer function. That filter, rather, and say derive the transfer function. I could give you, oh, you wish you paid more attention now, don't you? OK. There's another circuit you can get its transfer function. I could go all day, OK, with this kind of nonsense. 
There's another one. Uh, this one's really hard. Let me see if I can even remember how to draw it. It's that hard. I think it goes like this. I'm not sure that's exactly the topography. But I mean, there's all these different circuits that exist, okay, for filtering signals. And I don't want to get into the specifics right now, but the point is that if you paid attention in circuits one and two, all right, getting the transfer functions for these equations shouldn't be that hard. All right? How does it work for a um, how does this work for the inverting op amp? Screw KCL. You've solved the circuit once, right? You never solve it again. Once you solve this circuit, well, okay, I shouldn't say screw KCL. I should say this. Always have KCL in your back pocket in case you forget. How about that? But more importantly, what you should have picked up along the way, yes, it's always going to be, So remember, this is R1, this is R2. This topology always gives you R2, so it's minus R2 over R1, right? So what have you got here? R2. It's the parallel impedance of a capacitor and a resistor. How do we take parallel impedances? You know how to do that. If you have R1 and R2, and I say take their parallel resistance, does anybody remember the formula? Yeah, you can, you can either take the reciprocal of the sum of reciprocals, or you, right, which always confused me, or you can multiply them. It's the product divided by the sum. That's the other one. That's the other equivalent calculation you can do. Okay? So, you've got a resistor in parallel with a capacitor. So, it's, so if we called this R1, R2, and C, your impedance would, your, your, first you'd have to take the resistor in parallel with 1 over j omega c and apply the parallel impedance formula, which is product over sum. And then you'd have to take the minus of that and divide by R1. And if you can polish that turd, you get the transfer function. But the point is, is that with a little practice, you can take just about any circuit and calculate a transfer function. And now you're getting somewhere. Now you're getting somewhere. Let's do, um, I've got 15 minutes. I want to do a couple by hand, and then we're going to show you some tools in MATLAB for plotting these. OK? Because these are pretty handy. Um, so let's actually do this one by hand, and then we'll have that as an example. Because I do want to have, uh, we'll do a low pass and a high pass. I will not be here on Friday, but I have a special treat for you. Dr. Picconi is going to be here. What's that? He's, oh, he might give you a quiz. It's been a while since you've had a quiz, and I would hate to burden him with a full 50-minute lecture. So I might burden him with a 40-minute lecture and then have him give a quiz. Um, yeah, he's, he's, re, he's blowing up circuits one. And he is making it hard and awesome. But people are learning like crazy. I bet people are complaining that it's hard, but they're also not complaining about how much they're learning. Um, that's my guess. OK. And Sorry. it's stuff they're supposed to learn. What's that? And it's stuff they're supposed to learn. And it's so you're going to learn it anyway. <laughs> OK, so let's start by taking the parallel impedance of R2 and 1 over j omega c. So it's product over sum, right? Mm -hmm. So product <laughs> over sum. OK. So that's ugly, because it's a fraction of a fraction over a fraction. Yeah, so the easiest way to clean this up is to multiply numerator and denominator by j omega c. Easiest way to do it. OK. So when you do that. That leaves you with j omega R2C over Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad professor. Ooh. All right. Good. So that leaves you with R2 
over two C plus one. Okay, good. Does that make sense? Stop at every step and say, does this make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Here's why. At low frequencies, what does a capacitor always do? Open or short? At low frequencies, capacitors are open, right? Capacitors only pass charge if the voltage is changing, right? C I equals C D V D T. If there's no D V D T, there's no I. Okay? If there's no I, it's like an open circuit. So at low frequencies, this capacitor will be open. And if the capacitor is open, what's going to be their parallel impedance? Resistor. If that capacitor is open, it's like it's not there. And then you're just left with the resistor. No, you're left with the resistor. Okay. Does this equation predict that? At low frequencies, what's the parallel impedance? If I, if I said omega to be really small, then what am I left with? This term goes away because it's dominated by the 1. And I'm left with R2. So that's good. Equation matches circuit. The voltage what voltage? Because they're in parallel? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I want you to ask the question. If, but what I'm saying is, like, if, if I were to put, I mean, the voltage is equal across them. But if that voltage is very low frequency. You said the output. What do you, what do you mean by output again? So, OK. What I'm doing is I'm putting, oh, freaking marker nightmare. So what I've got is I've got a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. And I'm, I've written an equation for their parallel impedance. And what I'm trying to do is to make sense. Does this actually make sense for, for that parallel impedance? And I think it does. Because at low frequencies, the capacitor is not going to pass a lot of current. So at low frequencies, that capacitor is basically like an open. So if I put resistor R2 in parallel with an open circuit, what's going to be the resistance between those two points? It's just going to be R2. Right? Your electrons are going to come over here and they say, oh, I've got to get from here to here. The only way to do it is to go through R2. Now, what about high frequencies? Okay. What's my, how's my capacitor going to behave at the very highest frequencies? Short. Like a short. So at high frequencies, my capacitor shorts. What is the equation of a resistor in parallel with a short? Short. It's short. So short. What's that resistance equal Zero. to? Zero. Zero. That's right. When an electron gets to this intersection, it says, I can go through R2, or I can go through 0. Screw I'm here. So forget the resistor. I'm going through 0. So does this equation predict that? At high frequencies, does this predict an impedance of 0? Yeah. If omega is really, really big, it dominates the 1, you're left with R2 over some really big number. And as omega gets really big, that goes to 0. So that's good. So this is, in fact, the parallel impedance. But I still need to get, so I've, right now, I've gotten R2 parallel 1 over j omega c. In order to get the total transfer function for the circuit, I still need to do a minus and divide by R1. And it turns out that's pretty easy to do. Minus over R1, the end. What kind of filter is that? I don't know. Somebody tell me with authority. I don't want low, huh? I tell low pass, right? <laughs> What happens, at low, what happens at low frequencies? At very, very low frequencies, this term disappears, and I'm left with minus R2 over R1. And the minus is just a phase shift, so let's not worry about that. So at low frequencies, I'm going to have not just before, when I was just doing like the regular low-pass filter, my low frequency gain was 1. Output equals input. Now my low frequency gain is R2 over R1. I'm not just passing my low frequencies. I'm amplifying them, which is cool because I do have an amplifier here. All right, what happens at high frequencies? Careful. Uh, like you'll have a large denominator that keeps on increasing, so you'll be dividing by something as well. Right. 
So let's, let's be careful here. So at, you're right. At the very highest frequencies, that means you can ignore the plus 1 term. So you're left with R2, R, minus R2 over R1 over J omega R2C. The R2s are going to cancel. So you're going to be left with minus 1 over J omega R1C. And as omega gets really big, that term is going to go to 0. So yeah. Pretty sweet. Anybody want to take a whack at the cutoff frequency of this circuit? What's that? There's two R's. Please be specific. Why R2? Yeah, no, you're right. Just to develop that concept a little more. Okay, so the. Well, R2 is part of the feedback network. Yeah. Okay, so, because they're the same, they're kind of so, you can think of this in two ways. So, here's the math way, and it's, you know, we need to understand the math way. If you take H of omega, if you find the roots of the denominator, Right. In other words, find values of J omega that make denominator equal zero. Those have a special name. Those values are called poles. Okay? And up until now, you knew those as cut off cut off frequencies so let's just do that approach what is what are the roots of what values of j omega make your denominator equal to 0 All right your denominator is j omega r2c plus 1 equals 0 Right, it, well, your denominator is J omega R2C plus 1. And I'm saying solve that for omega equals 0. Sorry, solve that for, to find the values of J omega that set your denominator equal to 0. So it looks like that will be when it happened when J omega equals minus 1 over R2C. So... For reasons that I don't want to get into, ignore the minus 1. Your cutoff frequency is 1 over R2C. That will always be the case, poles and zeros. You're going to need this for controls. You can have poles and zeros coming out of your ears. All right? So, um, I mean, the, the other way to think about it is if you look at the circuit, it's the interplay between which two elements that's going to decide your cutoff. And it really is R2 and C. Because we said at low frequencies in this term, the resistor dominated. And at high frequencies, it was the capacitor that was shorting it all out. So it really makes sense that it's the trade-off between resistor 2 and the capacitor that sets whether or not this system is a low pass, is, is passing or rejecting. Okay, the R1 is really just along for the ride in this case. Nice. What do you think? All right, let's do, um, you know, I've got three minutes of your time, which is a valuable thing. Let me, um, let me just at least get you started uh, on some MATLAB tools that you can look at. I could even get this to work before before I run out of time. <clears throat> okay. 
So um, let's just do the, the basic low-pass filter circuit that we saw before. So let's say R equals, um, I don't know, a kilo-ohm, and C equals uh, a microfarad. So does anybody, what was our transfer function? Was it 1 over J omega RC plus 1? Okay. So I'm going to say H equals transfer function. So TF is a built-in function in MATLAB. And all I've got to do is I've got to tell it the coefficients of my numerator and the coefficients of my denominator. Okay? So the numerator was just 1. So that's easy enough. Now my denominator was, had two terms. It had a J omega RC term and a 1 term. So the first thing I'm going to do is the coefficient of the J omega term. So what was the coefficient of the J omega term? R times C. R times C. Okay, and then after that there was the, the constant term, which was just 1. Does it, does it look at the 1 multiplied by J omega? Yeah, well, if it was 1 times J omega, then you would just put 1, you put a 1 there, if that makes sense. But you have the 1, so does it, how does it know there's no J omega? But just because of the order. Because, because it always works, like basically it looks at your denominator and it says 1 plus J omega times some constant, plus J omega squared times some constant, plus uh, J omega cubed times some constant. So you always start with the 1, and then you just keep giving it constants, and, and the, the, you know, the, the J omega is, uh, is assumed in that order. Okay, so if I, I ran this, if I just say H, look at what it did for me. Look, H is a transfer function. It's a continuous time transfer function. And it says um, H is equal to 1 over, this says S. S is equal to, G, it's just shorthand for J omega. So it's 1 over J omega RC plus 1. Now watch this. You thought you were going to have to go type, you know, if you wanted to get the, the transfer function and plot it, up until now your plan was, Calculate by hand the magnitude, like the 1 over square root of j omega r, whatever. 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega rc squared, and then plot it, right? Which is fine, but that's a pain. So there's a built-in tool to do that, and in MATLAB it's just called Bodhi. Say Bodhi of H. Please tell me I installed the Bodhi module. Yes, I did. Look at me. All right. So you've got two plots. Up here you've got the magnitude plot. So they've used the standard uh, plotting uh, notation of, of logarithmic uh, frequency on the x-axis and decibels on the y-axis. So do we have a low-pass filter? Sure looks that way. At low frequencies, we have a gain of 0 decibels. That's a gain of 1. At high frequencies, we have a constant roll-off. Okay, We'll talk more about that on uh, probably on uh, whatever comes next, Friday. And then this is your phase response. Low frequencies, high frequencies. Pretty nice, right? So uh, essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be learning how to use this, these tool, some of these built-in tools in MATLAB to design and analyze our filters. But for right off the bat, the Bode tool is, is you can't beat it for simplicity. All right? It's a pretty good thing. We'll, uh, the other command that we're going to learn is... The, is um, there's some filtering commands where you can just basically take a signal, pass it into your filter H, and it'll just tell you what the output is. That's pretty great. The x axis is on a logarithmic scale. How do you get it to a frequency? It is a frequency scale. It's just the frequency is logarithmically spaced. Right? If we look at the x axis, frequency with respect to radians, radians per second. All right? You can actually, I think if you right click on it, you can get it to. Um, you, somewhere in here, there's a, there's a thing where you can actually say, oh, maybe it's under properties. Somewhere under here, there's a way here, units. I want my x-axis in kilohertz. It'll convert it to kilohertz for you, right? I want my magnitude not in dB. I want it in absolute units, okay? I don't want the, I don't want the log scale. I want the linear scale. I mean, you can mess with it however you want, 
But that's sort of the default is it's giving you log units and it's giving you in dB. But it is frequency on the x-axis. And the, well, right now it gave you phase in degrees, but again, if you go to properties, you can change that. Right? I want, I want it in radians. That's it, you've got it in radians. Okay. So you'll see Piconi on Friday, you'll see me on Monday. Have a nice day. Yes. For, for what?